I am very excited to be introducing William Stixrude and Ned Johnson. William is a clinical neuropsychologist and the founder of the Stixrude Group, a local organization specializing in neuropsychological assessment of children, adolescents, and adults with learning, attention, social, and or emotional disorders. He's also a member of the adjunct faculty of the Children's National Medical Center, and he holds a faculty appointment as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the George Washington School of Medicine. Ned is the president and founder of Prep Matters, a DC-based test prep tutoring company. He is a self-professed professional tutor geek since 1993. Mr. Johnson has devoted in excess of 35,000 hours in one-on-one -on -one test prep for nearly the entire alphabet of tests. They're both here to discuss their new book and number six on the Washington Post bestsellers list. Yeah. <laughs> The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. In this age, but also in this town in particular, there is a culture of parenting, uh, a culture of parents putting a lot of pressure on their children to achieve, whether it be through countless extracurricular activities, micromanaging homework, or treating good grades as the only measure of success. This book is an important counterargument to that pervasive culture of parenting, offering another less stressful and more effective approach. Publishers Weekly wrote of the book, Stixrude and Johnson make a highly persuasive case for how parents can help their children segue from feeling stressed and powerless to feeling loved, trusted, and supported. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you, folks. Can, can you hear me in the back? Great. Thank you all so much for coming. It's, it's, just, it's, it's wonderful to see uh, so many <laughs> wonderful faces. And um, is this working? Okay, okay. Um, is this better? Yeah. Okay, okay. So I'll talk close to the mic. Um, I sing rock and roll, so I'm pretty used to being right on the mic. And uh, various, pl various places in our book, we talk about uh, pressures that kids experience related to getting into college. And I just tested a kid who gave me kind of an interesting take on it a couple of weeks ago. Is a, sev is sec is a second grader, seven year old. And at one point in my interview, I, I said, Are there some things you worry about? She said, well, I really try to do good in school because I know my grades will count for college. And I want to go to a good college. I want to go to AU because they have an Elevation Burger and I love their fries. <laughs> 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 so so um, Ned, Ned and I met probably eight or nine years ago. And um, about eight years ago, we, we started giving some lectures together. And we've lectured a lot about motivation, about help, helping kids develop self-motivation. Uh, it's uh, still not loud enough. Um, we've talked a lot about the effects of stress uh, on kids' development. Uh, we talked about technology. We talked a lot about sleep. And at one point, we started thinking, let's write something up. And, and we're trying to figure out what, what's the best angle for kind of organizing the way we understand the problems that kids face and the stuff that helps them. And Ned, Ned at one point said, you know, I think that, that a sense of control pulls together everything that we, we talk about. And we, we knew that a low sense of control is arguably the most stressful thing in the universe. And we knew that you really can't become self-motivated as a person if you don't have a sense of autonomy or sense of control over your own life. But when we studied the sense of control, the, the literature on the sense of control itself, we learned that it's related to everything you could possibly want for your kid and for yourself. It's, it's, it's related to mental health, to physical health, longevity, career success, academic success. So we, the, the, we, we see a lot of kids who, f who feel helpless, hopeless. We see tons of kids who feel overwhelmed. And so we wrote a book. It's really kind of a how-to manual to help kids feel more, a stronger sense of control of their own life. And it's not, we want, we want kids to, to be controlling or to feel that they're supposed to control everything in their life. It's just this confidence that, you, that you, have some, you have control. You can be in a hotel room with an obnoxious buzzing, and somebody comes in and gives you a little a buzzer, the little button that says, if you press this button, it'll, it'll reduce the volume of the buzzing. And it's less stressful for you, even if the button has no relation to the buzzer. It's the sense of control. And Bill and I may not seem like an obvious pair. Uh, we, <laughs> we might not have been the same band together at some point. Uh, we, uh, um, 
you know, he does his work mostly with kids where, or in families where, where school isn't easy, where there are a lot, of, a lot of headwinds and a lot of challenges. And I tend to work with kids who, you know, for whom school is, is going well, per, perhaps too well, that they're, that they're overly driven and, and I kind of have to peel them off the wall a bit. Um, his work is from, from kids from the youngest age. Most of my work is with uh, juniors in high school. I'm sort of like the Dick Clark of test prep, I guess. Um, and his kids are in their 30s and have children. I have a, an eighth grade daughter and a, t and a son who's in 10th grade. Um, but still, in my experience, everything that I've been able to do to help kids feel more in control makes them less anxious and ultimately makes them less successful, even on things like the infernal uh, standardized exams. This generational thing has been, has been terrific. I mean, I, it's, it's so great for me because I, I, I raised my kids, and Sarah and I did really uh, using a lot of the stuff that we have in the book, and, and Ned's using it with his own kids. And, and I'm, I'm a, I'm, uh, at my age, I have the kind of experience that one of my friends had where recently uh, uh, her, her five-year-old granddaughter said, Grandma, how old are you? And she said, 65. And the girl said, starting from one? <laughs> 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 you know, I just figured I just figured these bad news of the price you get for having grandchildren who who, who are here today. I, mean, I couldn't I couldn't be more excited to 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 say. Um, so, Ned and I really think that the, the sense of control is such a big deal for for kids for two main reasons, and and we, we refer to it as the twin scourge of stress-related mental health problems and stress, uh, motivational disorder. We call motivational disorders or, or these kind of motivational extremes. And I'll talk about the mental health part for just a minute. And I mean, most of you know that we're, we're seeing this epidemic of stress-related mental health problems in children and teenagers. Just in the last six years, there's been a 37% increase in, in depression in kids. And in really affluent, uh, high-achieving areas, it's just scary. A guy, a, a guy, Stuart Slavin, a social scientist, went into uh, Palo Alto High School uh, f uh, where they had some uh, spate of suicides. And he, he surveyed the kids, and 80% reported really significant symptoms of anxiety, 54% reported really significant symptoms of depression. And these are stress-related problems in the sense that anxiety, depression, self-harm, chemical use, they're, they're, re they're a result of a stress response, a fight or flight response, it just stays turned on. And if it stays turned on a long time, it has a really bad effect in the brain. The, the, when, when kids or, or their parents are chronically stressed, it, it makes the amygdala, the part of the brain that senses threat and reacts to threat, bigger and more reactive. And it makes the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that can think logically, smaller. The part of your brain that can regulate the rest of your brain and, and keep, it, it's to keep you in your right mind smaller. So the last thing we want kids to do is to, to grow up being highly stressed because it's just not, it, it's not a good thing for the long-term development. So I work mostly with kids who struggle. If, if, with, if they have motivational issues, a lot of them are overly stressed. I mean, they are, they're, they're getting five hours of sleep a night. They're afraid that if, if, they, if they get six hours of sleep, that some kid in another part of the country is going to take their college admissions slot. And we also have kids who struggle to kind of do anything. They've gotten this message that if they're not top 10% in high school, they'll never be successful in life. And so by definition, you've got about 90% of kids who are saying, why bother? So it's really a problem. Uh, and we got at this piece of autonomy uh, from something called self-determination theory. And self-determination theory is one of the most well-vetted models of motivation. And it holds that to be motivated, people really need three things. They need to feel a sense of competency, right? You're not going to play more tennis or you can never even hit the ball over the net. You need a sense of relatedness. If you, when I ask kids, what's your favorite class? And they'll say, math. And I'll say, well, is it the class or is it the teacher? And more than half the time, they'll say, it's the teacher. Miss Sanchez, she's just the best. And then the third thing is this piece of autonomy. The, again, as Bill said, the sense of control, sense of agency, that what I do makes a difference. So uh, Edward Deasy, who's one of the progenitors of this, was kind enough to spend some time with us. And we asked him, said, is it true? It's our sense that of those three things, that it's a sense of autonomy that, that, that we think is the most important. And he said, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And, and the challenge is, in places like DC, we tend to sacrifice a lot 
for that competency piece. If only my kid is on the travel soccer team by second grade, I know he'll get a college scholarship, right? Can we push him, you know, that advanced math, yeah, she's doing, you know, three hours of, of math tutoring, you know, three, three times a week in fourth grade, but it'll be worth it in the long term. But keep in mind, it's like a three-legged stool. If you make that competency piece really strong and really long, particularly if you sacrifice your relatedness with your kid and her sense of autonomy, this doesn't make for higher heights. This makes for something that topples over. So be, we really want to be careful that we don't goof up this piece of autonomy. A lot of people know, who knows the work of Carol Dweck? You guys know Carol, so the idea of mindsets. And so uh, the, what she calls the growth mindset is the idea that I'm not born naturally good at anything, right? That I get better at hard work. And what is that, sen what that, that sense of growth mindset is nothing more than the belief that th if I work hard, the sense that if I, if I work harder, this I may be kind of lousy now, but I'll get better over time. And it's really, really helpful to, one, help kids feel not stressed if it's not going well, and to give them the, the, the oomph to want to keep at this because you're going to get better. And then the last person we look at, uh, a guy named Mihaly Sixton Mihaly, it's way too many letters, don't ask me to spell it. He's the guy who had the idea of flow. Okay, you've heard flow or the idea of being in the zone. And it's what happens when people are really working hard at something. The perfect model is really to be challenged but not be threatened. And we see this most in, in, in pastimes. It's often in things outside of school. There's a researcher named Reed Larson who, who preaches the idea of helping kids develop a passionate pursuit of their pastimes. And kids will work super, super hard. And we say it doesn't really matter if you're not great in school now. What it matters is that you find something that you really like, that you're good at, and you're prepared to work hard at. Because when you're working really hard at something that, that you're both getting good at and really like, it's that what Ken, Sir Ken Robinson calls the element, right? And it's in that state of flow that you're sculpting a brain that can really work hard when it wants to, that's really motivated. I had a student a few, a few years ago who, he was a good but not a great student, but he was a really good soccer player. And he uh, asked his parents if he could audition for this, uh, what's called an academy team. It's kind of the elite level of soccer. And he made the team, and he was super excited. And he talked it over his folks, and his folks said, decided that you really shouldn't do that. You shouldn't spend that time on soccer. You should really spend more time on your grades. Well, I think you can imagine how that worked out. He didn't have motivation for his grades. He had motivation for soccer. And we would submit that if they had let him do that soccer, Again, it would have changed his brain chemistry. He'd have a whole lot more dopamine, and he might have had the oomph to work a little bit harder on his schoolwork because he had that flow experience of having soccer go so well. And w when I first read about this Reed Larson, who, who said that, that, that it's this passionate pursuit of stuff you love that builds self-motivation more, more than just dutifully doing your homework, it, it, it made sense to me because when I was in high school, I, had a, I graduated with a 2.8 grade point average, and, and I knew I needed a 2.5 to get into the University of Washington, and I don't know why I spent all that extra energy overachieving, <laughs> you know? But, um, but I, I was a pa I, so I, I turned in everything late. I, did, I, I just uh, avoided most of my homework, but... I was passionate about rock and roll. I was in a band. I still play with three of the guys in my band. <laughs> so, but but uh, I was passionate about it. And I would go into my, my this little room where I had uh, my instruments, and, and I, I would play or practice or learn songs. And I, 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 I'd tell myself, I'm going to go in there for 45 minutes, and then I'll, then I'll do some homework. And I'd come out two and a half hours later thinking that, that maybe 45 minutes had gone by. And I really think th that I developed a brain that once I found something that, that made sense to me to study, once I found a career that made sense to me, I could just go pedal to the metal. And I, 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 I love this side. That, that, and so when I see kids now, and I see tons of kids who are not that motivated for school, but they're really passionate about something, I say, I don't worry about you. I don't worry about you because I know you're sculpting a brain that's going to know how to be in this brain state that combines high focus, high energy, high, ter de high determination, and low threat. Because that's, that's where you want to be most of the time in, in adult life. Um, and so, um, and I'll just also say, you can't become independent if you don't have a sense of autonomy, you don't have a sense of, this is my life, and I'm going to get out of it what I put into it. And it's true. We have a chapter in the book on, on kids with ADHD and learning disabilities and autism, and it's n true no matter what. And it's harder for some kids to develop autonomy than it is for others. But, again, you can't become dependent, independent unless you have it. Now, so let, let's talk about some of the stuff that, that we recommend in the book that, that parents can do to build the sense of autonomy. 
And uh, when I started out my career, I, I, I'm a neuropsychologist. I test kids for a living. And for the first 15 years or so, I also did a lot of psychotherapy. And I have experiences like talking with a 30-year-old who would say, I spent my whole life living up to other people's expectations. I want to figure out what's important to me. Or I talked to an underachiever, and, and, I, and, I, and I'd say, so w when you don't turn an assignment, who's, who's most upset? Who, who do you think the kid would say, invariably? My mom, all right, right, absolutely. And I said, so who's most uh, next most upset? My dad, then who's next? My, my, my brother, then my, my teacher, then my tutor. You know, <laughs> the kid was never on the friggin' list, you know? And, and, and <laughs> it just seemed to me something's wrong with this picture. And so, and uh, I also, uh, so many of the families, they'd, they'd say stuff like, God, I just dread dinner time because after dinner we have to fight about homework for two hours. And when I learned in 1986 that homework doesn't contribute to learning in elementary school, I thought, what's this friggin' for? And so, what I recommended to parents was to say to your kid, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And the next step is you see yourself as a consultant. You move into a consulting role and you say, I'm willing to do whatever I can to help you. I'm willing to get a tutor if you need it. I'm willing to set my own consulting hours from 6.30 to 7.30, but not willing to, to chase you around. I'm not willing to have to be all this stress and conflict between us about your homework. I'm, I'm not willing to act like it's my responsibility to make you do it because if I do, I'm going to weaken you. Because I'm going to reinforce the idea that somebody other than you is ultimately responsible for it. And uh, <laughs> one of my clients just sent me an email recently. She's reading our book. And she said, I told my eighth grade boy that I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And he had smiled. And he hugged me. And he said, is something wrong with you, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> My, uh, my son, who's uh, now in 10th grade, when he was in 5th grade, uh, we had an experience where my, my, I was cooking dinner. My wife uh, was helping him with homework, and she asked about, why didn't you do such and such or, or hand in such and such? And he stopped, you know, a little bit frozen, and then, and then spit at her, because you didn't remind me. And I'm in the middle, I come running out like the guy in the, you know, calling a timeout in the middle of a, of a basketball game. And it's a timeout, people. And I look right at him, and I said, listen, pal. I said, you do not throw your mom under the bus. In case you're not clear, she's already done fifth grade, okay? <laughs> this, is her, this is your work, not her work, okay? Let's be really clear on that. And then I turned and looked at her, and I said, and lady, holy smokes. My wife, who is, who is arguably the most capable, competent, educated, she's frankly good at almost everything in ways that are vaguely annoying. Um, um, and because she's sitting over to my left, I'll say she's beautiful and charming to boot. <laughs> Right, and she looks, she's multitasking, the ultimate. <laughs> but I looked at it, I said, I said, sweetheart, he has every expectation to think that you'd remind him, because you always have. You're, you're so capable that you're not only responsible for you, you're responsible for everybody else in this family. But as Bill said, that's, that's a flawed model. That's a flawed model. And so we spent the, the rest of his middle school stepping way back and saying things like, you know, do you have a plan for your homework? He said, yeah, I've got it. And sometimes those plans were well conceived and sometimes poorly conceived and sometimes not conceived at all. Um, and asking, hey, do you, want, do you want help on that? And sometimes he'd say yes and sometimes he'd say no. And I, I'm happy to say that his parole officer said he's doing, he's doing terrifically right now. Um, <laughs> But, but the best part is it really changed. It he's been clean for three years now. Right, he? he's yeah, yeah. doing fantastic. <laughs> but the, the, the two things that were great about this, one is it really changed our relationship because he doesn't feel like we're on top of him all the time. He doesn't feel like we're doing things to him. He feels like we're doing things for him. And we'll ask, do you want, do you want some advice on that? And most of the time I said, no, I got it, Dad. Perfect, right? You know, and his, his mom and I are both, both educators. But more importantly, he will ask for help sometimes, and some of the stuff we can help him with. But he also comes and asks and said, hey, Dad, there's this big dance on Saturday night. W what do you think I should do if people are drinking alcohol? Well, boy, that's the kind of conversation you really want to have with your kids, right? You know, ideally, he'll get help from his friends on that math problem set if he needs it. But, but ideally, he's getting advice from me rather than his friends about alcohol, right? And the other thing that I'll say about this idea of being a consultant rather than a manager is as a parent, it is so much less stressful. Because if you thought it was your responsibility to make your kid do his homework and he didn't want to and all he has to do is close his eyes or lie flat on the floor, whew, that's going to be a long evening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that part of, part of this idea is that parent is consultant is that we, 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 we offer help, we don't try to force it. We offer advice. I mean, Ned and I both, if, if kids say something, and we have a different angle, we say, do, do you want to hear my angle on that? 
with our kids. We, 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 we seek buy it. Do, 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 do you want to hear another opinion? I've got some advice. Would you like to, to have it? And it's just, it's so, and sometimes they, they want it, sometimes they don't. But, you know, we, we have, I have parents frequently say, and I've told them a hundred times, or you know, I tell them all the time, well, <laughs> this, this works better, actually. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Um, and the, the, the second part of this is this idea of parent as consultant is we're, we're really big believers that kids can make good decisions for themselves. And I've felt for almost my whole career that the best thing you can say to an older child, an adolescent, is I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and learn from your mistakes. And I want you to practice making the important decisions about your life because I don't want you to send you off to college without having ma made these kind of decisions. And we, in our book, we, we talk about the rationale, for what, why kids can make, if, if you help them think through the pros and cons of a given situation, you give them information that they may lack, why they can make s s good decisions, and why it's important that they do. Because when you say to a kid, it's going to be your call, and this comes up a lot with me, because people ask me, where should my kid go to school? And, and unless they're five, I, I'm saying, better question is, how can we help your kid decide the best place to go to school? How can we help them make an informed decision? And that, that you can't make a decision without emotion. I mean, pe people who have had emotional centers in their brain damage, they can't decide what to have for breakfast or where to go to dinner. They, they can't because decisions require you to have a sense of what do I want? What's important? How might this affect other people? It requires empathy. It requires understanding. And I want kids to pay attention to their own emotions, I want them to pay attention to what's important to them. And w when, when kids don't feel forced, they just, they, they have to be honest with themselves. And it, it, it really, it, I've just seen kids make beautiful decisions. And you make this point, Ned, that, that about the, imp <laughs> the important ones, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, and you know, from my perspective, I want my son to own his own successes and to own his failures. Right, because if I make that decision for him, he says, "Well, you told me," and, and he, and in some ways, he can be motivated to have things blow up just so he can say, "I told you so." Right, which it, that's not a great place to be. Um, so we really have this idea of whose whose problem is it, right? And I want my son to to heed my and and seek out my advice, but I don't want to make the decision for him. Now, of course, this gets it gets harder, right? When you go from a five year old to fifth grade to high school, because we feel, have the sense of, yeah, 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 that's fine, but this is high school. These decisions are so momentous. I can't really, I can't, I can't let him make that decision because I'm afraid he'll screw up his whole life, and I get that. But we really want to recognize that in some ways, if, if we think about it, the message that we would then are giving our kid is, I trust, you to make I trust you to make decisions so long as they're not really important ones, so long as the decisions don't, don't really impact your life. Because when it comes to the really important decisions about your life, you're not the expert on you. Somebody else is. That's not, kind of not the one we want to give kids. Now, if we go back to the Stephen Meyer, th this idea that, that we want to be, a part of our job as parents is also. I, I forgot right. to mention oh, Stephen Meyer. Why, why don't you do oh, that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so yeah. Stephen Myers did this great uh, uh, research. We've given this talk a lot, as you can tell, um, with, uh, um, with mice. And, he, and they, they, they put these mice in cages, and they're, they're kind of constrained in there. And their tails stick out. And then they put a little electrodes on, and they shock them. And this is not a, a great way to spend your day, uh, no matter who you are. Um, <laughs> But it, and so they can measure their cortisol and watch it just kind of go through the roof. And if, if it's uncontrollable, it's, it's just dreadful for them. But they then put these, this little wheel in there. And the, the mice learn that if they spin the wheel, that the shock will stop. And so this sense that in, in the presence of being stressed, there's something I can do, it's enormously beneficial. And so even though they're getting shocked, the ability to do something makes their stress much lower. And here's the really fun part. After they've trained the mice to have a sense of control, they can then do the shocking thing again. But this time, they've disconnected the wheel. But the mice don't know this. And so they're getting shocked just as bad as they ever were. But it's the sense of being in control. They're not actually in control. But that sense is hugely inoculative against the stressor, right? And so we want our kids to tolerate, we want them to learn to tolerate stressors, right? So we don't help our kids develop resilience by, by shielding them from difficult things. We let them experience them with support. We don't make it endless and uncontrollable. We don't make it toxic. But we give them this opportunity to experience things for themselves and ask for help when they need them. 
There's another researcher, a guy named Michael Meany, had this really clever experiment with rat pups. So rat pups are baby rats. And the, the day that they were born, these research lab assistants would take the pups away and they'd sort of handle them for about a half an hour with these you know, latex gloves. And so if you're a rat pup, this is not warm, hairy, fuzzy mom. This is ah ha ah. And it's really distressing to them. And after about a half an hour, they put them back in with mom. And if mom would rush over and lick them and groom them, which is the kind of rat equivalent of hugs and kisses, they go, oh, they got all and all the stress, all the cortisol would just kind of bleed right out of them. And they do this back and forth of stress and recovery stress, going from, from oh my goodness to oh thank goodness. And this wired the brains of these pups. They created an entire lineage of, of, of rats that the scientists gave the really scientific moniker of California laid back rats. <laughs> and, and what happened was these rats were almost impossible to stress as adults. No, no matter what they did to them, because they had the sense that, well, it was bad in the past, but, but it was always fine. And no matter what had happened, it was always going to be fine. And really, you know, th that hashtag, I I've got this, no matter what it is, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But we need to, we need to let kids experience the stressor and then recover. And this brings us up to the, to the next chapter in our book, is the idea of parents as a non-anxious presence. And we, we stole this term. This may be the hardest thing you've heard all day. We set the bar, yeah. bar high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we didn't, we didn't make this term up. We got this from a, a guy named Edwin Freeman, who was a, who was a rabbi and a, and a consultant. He worked with churches and corporations and organizations of all types, including family units. And he found that it was so much more helpful if leaders weren't, weren't emotionally overly reactive. Actually, our, our, our friend Dana Milbank uh, has a piece in the, in the Post today. Uh, and he includes a quote from us that, that makes the point that when you have, st when you have bright and capable people, but a leader, who, who, so whoever's the chief executive of that organization, who is fear-mongering or emotionally reactive, those bright and capable people are become less bright and capable. And so I've made a career out of being what I kind of euphemistically describe as, as test prep therapy, right? And seeking to lower people's stress because they think better when they're less stressed. And I have kids all the time who come and they're upset. They had a terrible day. They bombed some tests, you know, B plus, of course. Um, you know, didn't get the score that they wanted. And they're, and they're understandably, they're frustrated and they're upset because they haven't yet, breaking in Carol Dweck, haven't yet got the, the success that they want. But almost, almost the second, there's, uh, the shoe dropping is, oh, and my, my parents are going to kill me. My mom's going to be so upset, blah, 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 blah. Which is terrible, right? And because if our kids are having a bad day and things haven't gone well, we really don't want, we want them to run to us, right, rather than running from us. And it works so much better if we as parents can be less anxious, in part because anxiety is contagious, right? If Bill is super stressed out by something, I don't know what, he's got a snake in his pocket, I don't know, and his amygdala is going off like this, I can feel it. My amygdala will react to that, even though I don't know what the stressor is. And so, you know this, if your kid is stressed, it makes you stressed. But if you're stressed, you make your kids stressed. And we have this whole chapter in the book about, be, about being a non-anxious presence. I tell the story about doing an epically bad job of trying to calm my two-year-old daughter when we were stuck on the tarmac, you know, in Chicago. I'm like, there, 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 right, right. Like, oh my God, it was, it was, it was, it was terrible, right? Since then, I've learned, I've learned to be much calmer and learned to meditate. But those, our amygdalas, we pick up other people's stress. And there are also these things called mirror neurons in the prefrontal cortex, and it's how we understand someone. So if I'm looking at this person and she's happy, my mirror neurons kind of dance. And if she's a little bit like this, I'm trying to, my mirror neurons are responding as well. And it's how we kind of have empathy and how we understand what other people are thinking. So this is important. You can't fake being a non-anxious presence. Okay, your kid comes home and something terrible in her world has happened, and you look and say, "Don't worry, it's going to be just fine," <laughs> right? Does she believe what you're telling her, or does she believe what she's feeling? And so, if stress is contagious, and we want our kids to be less stressed because we know it makes better brain development, and it also helps them be more bright and more capable, whatever their potential is, much much better if we ourselves aren't overly reactive. And the, the, the good news is that calm is contagious, too. Um, the same Michael Meany, who separated the rats and uh, returned to their mother, uh, took calm rats, rat mothers. And calm, calm rat mothers do a lot of licking and grooming. And he had a group of anxious uh, rat mothers who did little licking and grooming. And he fostered the offspring 
from the anxious mothers to the calm, licking and grooming mothers. And those, uh, th those fostered rats also became California laid back rats, <laughs> even though they're genetically programmed to be anxious. And so it, we, we, we want, I mean, th th simply life goes best if home is a safe base. I mean, life is stressful enough I mean, at work and for kids in, in school and social stuff. And, and we, just, we just like the idea that when you go home, it's, it's not also highly stressful. And so many, many parents, I mean, th that more than half the kids these days, will go, literally more than 50% will be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder during adolescence. And parents say, how do we help them? Well, one of the ways we help them is we manage our own ex anxiety. It just, it just makes sense to us. We, and, and we just like this idea of the ideal being a non-anxious, non-reactive presence. You think about it, it's much easier, much easier to soothe an infant as you were saying, you know, if you aren't, if you, if you, if you aren't uh, uh, anxious, it's much easier to help a three-year-old solve his problems. And, and, and th when, when Ned said, whose problem is it, which is what we ask parents uh, when they're referring to the kid's problem, because it's very, when you're anxious, it's very hard to, to resist going into solving the problem for the kid. So th th this, this makes a lot of sense to me. I've been, just been reading about uh, anxious uh, infants, and it turns out you know, what, what all infants, re all, all they need from adults besides food is they need warmth and responsiveness. You can't discipline an infant, obviously, but they need warmth and responsiveness. I'm just not sure there's ever a time when we don't benefit from having people in our lives who are warm and responsive. And part of the stress, of course, um, well, one thing that I'll say that, that can also help a lot is if you really take the long view, right? If you have the sense that, that maybe something really good is going to come out of the fact that fourth grade isn't going well, that that might be the source of a resilience. And, and if we have confidence that our kids are going to be great as, as adults, they're going to be great. I may be struggling as a 12-year-old, but by the time they're 20, I'm sure that they're going to have successful lives. And most of us, most of us have had experiences that things that, that we, we haven't had these perfect lives, right? Childhood was hard, or adolescence was hard, or college. But I think most of us, we wouldn't want to relive those things, right? But, we're, but we wouldn't want to take, get rid of them either because it's really what's given us the sense of our own ability to get, get through things that are, that are difficult. So if you can take the long view of the kids, it helps a lot. And also keep in mind that growth isn't linear, right? The, the, the tallest kid in eighth grade, the, especially the tallest boy in eighth grade, right, who towers over everyone in basketball, usually has to play guard by the time he gets to, you know, gets to be a senior, right? And if we know that about physical growth, we can also know that about intellectual and emotional growth, that, that kids grow in fits and spurts. And, and if we know that, it makes us be a lot less anxious our, ourselves. Um, I'll tell a s story about myself. I had a, a family that had, um, had a lot of headwinds. I had a father who was an alcoholic, and eventually, he eventually drank himself to death. And this was, uh, this was hard for my whole family. My mother struggled with some mental health issues, uh, particularly during the time my parents were getting divorced. And I ended up about three months in a pediatric psychiatric hospital in seventh grade which if I had to choose would probably not have been the ideal place for me. Um, but I think it, it actually was, because I really needed that big time out and to get away from stress. And my parents, in their own ways, were doing the best to support me. But it was, it was hard, and I was really anxious about coming back to school, in part because during those times, I, was, I you know, spent three years of my life really contemplating taking my own life. But I was also, during those three years, getting the best grade in every class that I had. Learning for me was, was relatively easy. But part of my stress was I didn't really appreciate that I could have a relationship with my parents and also with my teachers that as a person, separate from my grades, right? I had this sense that they loved me and approved of me because I was doing so well in school. And I was literally killing myself to get those grades. So going back, returning to seventh grade, I was pretty anxious about you know, what the kids were going to say to me. It was going to be some John Hughes movie when everyone was going to be you know, razzing me in the hallway. But I was really also anxious about what my teachers were going to say. Well, it's great to see you, Mr. Johnson, but where's three months of math homework? So it was with a certain amount of fear when I sort of creaked open the door to Miss Greenberg, my, my math teacher, my favorite teacher. And as I did, I opened the door, poked my head in, and she looked up from her desk, and, her, and it got a wild, wide smile. And she looked at me, she said, Ned, how are you? And it was enormously helpful to me. And it was enormously calming and relieving to me. And so if in all the craziness that you feel like might be going on with your kids, if you, if you take away nothing, one piece of advice that should be relatively easy is if you make it your highest priority, 
no matter what's going well or going poorly for your kids, to just really love them and just enjoy being in their presence. Because it's really, you may not appreciate, particularly in that short-term moment, but the long-term benefits of having your kids feel that is really enormous. So uh, one, of the, one of my favorite chapters in our book is, is a chapter called Radical Downtime. And the idea is that life is so fast-paced. We, we rest so, so little. We, we, we're so little. We have so little opportunity to just to uh, experience our own thoughts. We have so little time to, to be bored because we're, we're, as, as long as we've we got our phone with us, you know, there, there's very little opportunity. And kids have very little opportunity. And it just seems to us that downtime has always been important. But in, in this day and age, we, we, we need a more radical, we need to focus on ra what we call radical downtime, which is when you're doing something that appears to be doing absolutely nothing but you're actually restoring and refreshing your brain and your body. Uh, and we include in this, ch in this chapter daydreaming mi mind or mind-wandering and meditation. And sleep has a chapter of its own, it, but was included in this idea of radical downtime. And just kids these days are, are, are bored in 30 seconds. That, that there's a, s a study of young adults, uh, and they, they are just asked to sit with their own thoughts for 15 minutes. And 64% of the men in the study, in the several series of studies, chose to self-administer an electric shock rather than sit, after six minutes, <laughs> rather than sit with their own thoughts. Um, and 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 so, the, the and it turns out that there's all kinds of evidence that that being that daydreaming, and and is, is tremendously beneficial for creativity, for problem solving, and we want kids to have some bored, unplugged downtime. To, to reflect on themselves, in part because there's a, there's a network in the brain called the default mode network, which is discovered around 2000, and it only activates when you, aren't, when you aren't focused on a task. So it only activates when you're just sitting, basically reflecting on yourself, thinking about yourself and your relationships, or thinking about your past and your future. And the research suggests that this, for young people, having these periods of self-reflection uh, or just daydreaming are hugely important for developing a coherent sense of self and also for the, the capacity for empathy. And there's a lot of concern that with 24-7 uh, 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 plugged-in technology, that kids aren't having adequate time to reflect on themselves, which may be one of the reasons why they're, they're so uh, stressed. And the meditation piece, I mean, we, I, I, I don't think I've ever had a kid or a teenager ask me if I could find them a meditation teacher. I mean, it just, it just doesn't happen. But when kids do it, when kids do meditation, it really helps them. And, and Ned and I both practice transcendental meditation. And I've, 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 I've practiced for 44 years, done research on it. And you know, just I, I, years ago, I treated a bunch of kids who had headaches. And it was so, it was so mind-blowing because every, they, they were so, had such serious headaches that they couldn't go to school, a lot of them. And medicine didn't help. And I put a little th thermometer in their fingertip and an EMG lead in their forehead that picked up their muscle tension. And they'd sit and they'd think their mantra uh, and the, 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 muscle, the, the skin temperature, as they got more relaxed, would go up and up and up and up and up. And the muscle tension would look like this on a graph. And after, after, when after about two minutes of meditation, it would be a bottom line with no tension at all for the rest of the meditation. And I, I, I treated 15 kids in a year, 14 of them didn't have headache problems after, after uh, three months of this stuff. And it was so dramatic. And I, I, I saw a kid years ago who, uh, I, it was a client of Bonnie Zucker, one of the great anxiety therapists in, in this area. And he was really unhappy. So Bonnie came in and we had a session together because I had tested this kid. And I was going to remind him of, of all the positive things I learned from testing. And the kid cried a lot, a lot of the session because he, he was just preoccupied that he disappointed his teachers and his parents. And the, the mom asked, what, what else can we do? And B Bonnie and I are both fans of meditation and said, well, if he'll do it, meditation would help him. So I, I, I call her maybe nine months later, he's a kid towards the end of seventh grade, I, and, I, and I, just, so I just call him to check in. How's he doing? She said, he's had an incredible year. He's so happy. He's doing really well. And I, and I said, did he ever learn to meditate? She said, yeah, he's been doing it all year. She said, oh, my God. I think that's why he's had such a great year. And I'll, I'll, I'll also, in terms of this on the non anxious presence, there's a kid with autism who learned TM, and, and somebody asked him what, what, what it's, you know, what, what's come of it. And he said, TM calms the mind and it calms the mom. 
And, <laughs> and my, my best meditation story, I, I, some of you have heard this before, but uh, several years ago we did a study on teaching TM, we taught TM to, uh, uh, eight, to middle school kids with, with eight ADHD. And they all said after three months that they could focus better and they were less, they're less anxious. This one kid who was wildly impulsive said, before I started meditating, if I was walking in the hall and somebody bumped me, I just stopped and turned around and hit him. But now if, I, if I've, been I've been meditating, if somebody busts me in the hall, uh, hall, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? <laughs> <laughs> That's progress. Bill and I gave a, a, a talk similar to this a handful of years ago at the Murray School. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, I think one of us turned to the other and said, if, if there were one thing that you were going to focus on for kids, what do you think would be the most helpful thing? Uh, and this is before we got to the sense of control. And Bill said, I, I think it would be sleep. And he said, what about you? And I, I said I, the same thing. And I've been paid really a king's ransom, uh, ostensibly doing test prep, um, but really spending my time lecturing kids and trying to, to share with them all the science about sleep. Because we know that, that all those executive functions of problem solving, creativity, decision making, mental flexibility, emotional control, all reside in the prefrontal cortex. And your amygdala, your threat detector, when it fires, kind of just kicks this part just clear offline. And so we know that when we're tired, your amygdala is about 60% more reactive. And it really just scrambles your thinking. And the, the, the line that I often use with kids is, it, it, re it really doesn't make a lot of sense for us work to work really hard to put a bunch of things into your brain if when you get to the test, because you feel too stressed, you lose your mind. Right? We kind of we have a problem if that happens. And the more rested you are, the more the prefrontal cortex regulates the amygdala right, and keeps it, keeps it more online. I was talking to a student the other day about this and explaining to him you know, the, 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 the uh, impact on executive functions, again, including these, this emotional reaction. And I said, do you ever notice, I'm sure we've all had this experience, do you ever notice when you're really tired that you feel like the, the whole world's just kind of out to get you a little bit, you know, people are cranky? And I looked at him and said, do you ever notice how when you're really tired, you feel like your mom's just really annoying? And he's, he's a wicked sharp kid and he doesn't miss a beat. And he said, my God, I must be tired all the time. <laughs> Now his mom, to his credit, leaned over. Um, I think she punched him. No, but she gave him a hug. Um, and they, I mean, they're, they're great folks, but, but I, I talk about this a lot. Because I, I think if there's one thing that I would do that would, would probably calm the world, you know, in, 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 including some of our elected leaders who are sort of more um, provocative, uh, provocative than, than presidential, if, if people were more, if people were more well rested, in part, you know, they wouldn't feel like the whole world is out to get them. Right? Because they'd just be, just be more peaceful. So I almost, almost every week, um, I, I end up with a kid coming and talking about somehow where, where technology has messed with them a little bit. Um, uh, it usually goes something like this. So the kid comes in, I really didn't do well in that section. So well, what happened? Well, I don't know. I just missed a whole bunch. Okay. Um, well, did you take it in my office or you take it at home? Well, I took it at home. Okay. Uh, was your mom you know, giving you a hard time? No, no, I was the only one at home. Huh. Well, how, and I, and I, the, it's always the same thing, and I, and I know what the outcome of the story is, and I always say, well, did, well, how did you time Who timed you? Oh, I timed myself. Aha. Uh -huh. did, you, did you do that with, with the kitchen timer? They don't even know what a kitchen timer is, <laughs> right? So, well, no, no, I use my phone. I say, oh. Well, were you on it? No, but, no, but I wasn't paying attention to it. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm so sure, right? And say, uh, um, yeah, but did you get any text when, when they came up? And so, well, yeah, no, but, but I, didn't, I didn't look at them. <laughs> There's this great piece from uh, Michigan State you know, University we have in our book that says 2.8 second interruptions will double people's error rates. This, this alone makes kids go, oh my gosh, which then gives me the opportunity to say, and by the way, where does your cell phone sleep? What, what, what do you mean? They get very anxious about this. I said, at the end of the night, it, it, do, does it charge in your bedroom or in the kitchen? And almost always, they say, in their bedroom. And I said, yeah, but, but and I go through a whole bunch of literature at them. And I said, so you really, you want to have that in your bedroom, in, in, in charge in the kitchen. And then they'll all say, this is great, but I use it for my alarm clock. Now, my experience is that their parents are their alarm clock, but, but that being said. And so I'll look at a kid and say, so you're telling me, and you expect me to believe this, and I know you're a bright kid, but you expect me to believe that your parents are spending, I don't know, $40,000 for an independent school, which a lot, a lot of my clients are, and they're paying me hundreds of dollars an hour for test prep. And there's nobody in your life, including your nana, who can come with $14 for a proper alarm clock. <laughs> Not buying it. So, so every week I buy at least one clock on Amazon and go, here. So we're, um, th th we're just about out of time. And, and the, 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 the last thing that we wanted to talk about, we'll just, we'll just take a couple minutes to do it, is that we want kids to have an accurate model of reality. 
And you know, I, I gave a lecture uh, to an AP English class at, at, at Whitman a few years ago, and, and the teacher came up to me. I talked about stress and sleep deprivation, what it does to the brain. And the teacher came up and whispered, she said, these kids all think it's either Yale or McDonald's. You know, and 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 it's the, and many kids in this area grew up thinking that, that the that the road to success is incredibly narrow, and you can't fall off it for a second, and it's just completely and utter, utterly delusional. I used to call it psychotic thinking because it's so out of touch with reality. But there's actually a, 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 a diagnosis in the DSM called shared delusional disorder, and I figured this is it's kind of a shared delusion about what it takes to be successful and what a successful life really what it feels like to, as adults to be successful. And I I, I think that um, th that this, this model. It just makes a lot of kids highly anxious, and it makes a ton of kids discouraged. I mean, if, if we think that the idea that, that the top 10% students are the only ones who are going to be successful, why bother? And I see a lot of the kind of why bother kids, and I tell them, I tell them, that this, and I don't know why we just don't tell kids the truth, that it really doesn't seem to make very much difference where you go to college in, in terms of how much money you make, in terms of how successful you are. You've ruined my business, Bill. What's that? I said you've ruined my business, Bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, th th there's advantages. I mean, the, 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 an accurate model of reality is there's, there's, there's advantages to going to lead schools, but it's simply not necessary. And a lot of kids that I see, Th that that college is going to be hard, and I tell them that only that that less than that less than a third of adults have a college degree, and when kids are really struggling, I tell them that they can flunk every single one of their high school classes if they decide that was a bad idea. They can go to Montgomery College or any community college and get get 30 credits, which is a year, and they they can apply to Harvard, and Harvard doesn't want to see their high school transcript. And I just think that if kids and, it, what, and many parents don't want me to tell kids this stuff, but it actually it motivates them. It, it, it allows the really high achieving kids to align their energy in something that they want, as opposed to being driven by fear. And it, it gives it gives the lower achieving kids confidence that they're, they're, maybe I could find a, a way to make a living in this world. And we believe in telling the kids the truth about uh, that, that. There's many ways to become successful. When I see discouraged kids, the first thing I t tell them is, uh, is I, I flunked out of graduate school the, the first time I went. I went to the University of California, Berkeley, and, and I, I went for 20 straight weeks without turning in an assignment. When I work with underachievers now, I say, top that, to 20 weeks, <laughs> no, nothing. And, and, um, and I think about these, these kids, I, 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 one of them I tested 30, literally 30 years ago. I was talking to their dad, and, and he said, neither one of my kids wanted to go to college. They both went to art school. One of them is, the most, uh, is one of the most popular cinematographers in, in L.A. The other has his, his own very successful de design, uh, graphic design business. They make, they make more money than I do. And the dad said, I learned when you see a spark, throw gasoline on it. I love all that, and and I, um, in terms of the the multiple paths to success, uh, I have a lot of kids who really believe that they've internalized this message that if you don't if you don't go to an Ivy League school, you'll never be successful in life. And I asked them, I said, how many of your parents' friends do you know, and how many of them would you think of as successful people, and how many of them do you know where they went to college? And it's almost never do they, ha they have any any idea. And so I share this with kids, in part, and I share with them with all the colleges are more than a thousand universities now that are test score optional. And I and I give them these ideas that they're ultimate, there are different paths to get there. In part because knowing that there's a plan B makes you so much less stressed and actually more motivated to go after the plan A. If you have this idea that I have to, but I can't, can, can there be a more perfect recipe for for feeling anxious or feeling discouraged? And I think, it's a, I think it's a terrible idea for kids to have the idea that, that, that high school is a four-year addition for college. That's really not a healthy way to think about this. And I would say to them that the most important work you do as an adolescent is developing the brain you're going to have for the rest of your life. In part because we see at even these elite universities, people who have who've made themselves sick to get in, believing that if I'm successful enough, that it will make me, it'll, it'll make me have a peaceful life and it'll protect me against all the problems. But now what you've done is gotten yourself someplace really elite, but with a brain that's really damaged. I went to uh, my 25th college reunion is coming up. I went to Williams College, which some of you may know is a, is a, a pretty um, selective place. And, and they're starting this thing this year uh, called the Center for Integrative Wellbeing. And they said, we have so much anxiety here, we can't staff against it. Now, if you don't know Williams College, it's a school of 2,000 people total. 
most of the high schools around here are bigger than this. And so this very affluent, tiny little place, and they can't staff to it, it's, it's a problem. And you see it at Yale, more than 30% of students there re report feeling depressed. And, and more than 30% have suicidal tendencies. So it's, it's, it's a flawed model if we say that, that somehow, if you go through all this stress, but you get into an elite school, that it's worth it. To me, it's a little bit like, you know, I know he's been concussed four times, but we think he's going to go to the Super Bowl. It's just, it's not, it's not a good trade-off. So, I, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll close with that. Um, um, first of all, for, well, I got one point. First of all, um, thank you to Politics and Pros for having us here. Um, please support your local bookstores because this is this, these are the places that make it happen. We're, we're delighted to be here. Um, and if, and, <laughs> sorry, again. I, I was at one of these talks a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and the guy said, um, you know, b b buy, a book, b buy a book for Politics and Pros for, for your friends and for your family. And I'm thinking, if you've got known enemies, buy a book for them as well. It <laughs> may help your relationship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and so, so the so so you know we we have had a whole bunch of interviews, and, and a lot of people have asked, you know, so is this is is the problem here with kids today? Is it because their parents are doing A, B, and C? And I said we don't we don't look at that a, a, that way at all. That we actually feel very hopeful that this is not the fault of parents. It's a world that we live in where the temperatures just risen a little bit too much. But our feeling about this is actually a very hopeful one, that there are an enormous number of things, and frankly, pretty easy things, that we as parents can do to help our kids develop brains to make them be happier and more tolerant to stress and more resilient and more motivated. And it's often said that, that, that people, including our kids, they're going to forget what we, you've heard this, right? They're going to forget what we've said, and they're going to forget what we do, but they're going to remember how we make them feel. And that's our idea of a sense of control, that when all is said and done, what do we want our kids to feel? We want them to feel loved. And we want them to feel trusted. We want them to feel supported. And we want them to feel capable. And those aren't hard things to instill. And if they have those four things, we know that they're going to have the lives of both happiness and success that we all want for all of our kids. So thank you for being here. Thank you. So we, we can take some questions. How does a parent learn how to be non-anxious and non-reactive? <laughs> Is it in your book? Yeah, read, read, read chapter four. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really, what we talk about, so certainly taking care of yourself, I mean, t taking good care of yourself, so getting enough sleep, learning to meditate, exercising, all, all that stuff makes you less anxious. We also talk, as Ned said, we talk about taking a long view. I mean, all, all of our fear for, for our kids, it's about the future. It's about the, 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 the fears that are somehow they're in a hard place and they're going to get stuck and they aren't going to get better. And in my 40 years, uh, kids rarely get stuck. So some of it is taking a long view. Some of it, as Ned says, is if you focus on enjoying your kids and removing the, the, the barriers to that, whether it's the kid's behavior, whether it's too much uh, job stress, you work on that. Um, th there's, there's, there's a lot of it. That, there's, you remember stuff from Chapter 4 that... I think you've covered it well. Okay, I think go. you've covered there it well. Go. Other questions? Start with, start, start with sleep. Yes. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, um, obviously, I know you, Dr. Stick, Dr. Stickstrid, but for those of you who don't, I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area. And, um, and after completing my studies, largely because of my own experiences growing up on the autistic spectrum, I'm seriously considering... Um, working in a profession in which it will be possible to positively impact young people. Exactly what I'm not sure yet. Um, but uh, but but um, but my question is um, my question is um, what do you think is p particularly important to know in working in a field in which one works with young people about communication and the ability and the potential to positively impact uh, to positively impact young people using communication skills. So I, I think th that you, you communicate a lot to kids sim sim simply th th through who, who you are as a person. And I think that, that, that there's nothing that, that kids resp respond to more th 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 than, than warmth and concern and, and expressing confidence, expressing confidence in kids. I mean, I, th I think, I think that, that so certainly one of the main points in our whole book is that it's safe to trust kids. 
And I'm looking at Sue Zuckerman, a, a saint who's at a Jewish day school, who every time I see her, she reminds me that, that I offered my, my daughter $100 for a C. Uh, <laughs> she never took me up on it, but, but, uh, uh, but um, I, I, really, I really think, Nathan, that so much is, is figuring out ways to express confidence in kids. And the other piece, too, if I heard this correctly, in terms of helping kids with their own ability to communicate and express themselves, is that, too, if that's something that, that the kids might initially have a hard time with, that that, too, is a skill that can be developed with practice? Thank you. Hi, I'm Tisa Conlon. I'm an educator in Washington, D.C. I want to thank Ned so much for helping me as a parent and as an educator. And a question to all the parents is, how many times do you check your students' grades or homework? And since my child has been in fifth grade, I never, ever, ever look at their grades, ever, or their report cards. And I know parents <coughs> at my school who look at the grades three times a day. And if you're one of those, that's a way to stop, is stop looking at numbers and letters to identify your child. It's a, it's a, it's a I, I, I love that so much. I mean, certainly, the, the part in my book where, where in, in our book where uh, this is, and people have asked me about this because I, I told my kids, because when my kids were little, I, I was reading there's very little correlation between grades and success in, in life. And I told them I, I could really could, could almost care less about their report cards. What I cared about was they're developing themselves as, as people and as students. And the, the idea that, and, and so, so many people in my generation, their parents didn't go to college. Their parents d d d never knew anything that we were doing in school. And somehow we figured it out. And I think it's very hard these days. There's so much fear. That it's, it's hard to have confidence that kids can figure stuff out. And we can help them figure it out. But it's best when they figure it out on their own. And so we, we certainly say in the book that, that, that we, we, we ask parents n to, to not, to think about them as consultants. If it, there are some kids who are so disorganized that they can't manage their, their own assignments. And, and, and they, they, so we say, could I help you? Do you want me to help you go, go online and figure out what you're supposed to do? And if, and if the kid, kid buy-in from the kid, it's great. I also say, th Tisa, thanks for sharing that. I also say, I know, I know her daughter, Bliss, who is w w a sort of a remarkable, just a wonderful human being, and she she pursues so many things with such passion. It's it's almost embarrassing. B but but perhaps most importantly, um, Tisa and, and her daughter have one of the just most nurturing and authentic, and at this point almost adult adult relationships of a mother of mother daughter. Bond that I've ever seen. So, 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 not paying attention to homework, but paying attention to your kid for all those years, has clearly worked out well. So, so many of the kids that you see, Ned, and some that I see too, too to say stuff like, I, "I think my parents care, care more about my grades than do about me." I mean, it's just, it's just the wrong way to think. Yeah. Thank you. This was wonderful, and I can't wait to read your book. Um, I have a question. Buy it here. <laughs> I will. Um, you mentioned meditation and how you think that's very helpful for kids, but I didn't pick up if you said there's a certain type of meditation, and if so, what is it? Also, you said something about a mantra, and I didn't know if you gave the kids a mantra to think about or if you helped them come up with their own. So in our chapter in the book, we talk about mindfulness because it's so being so, so much used in schools. And Ned and I have much more experience with transcendental meditation. And I know hundreds of kids who have practiced transcendental meditation, done research on it. And my goal when we're finished promoting the book is to be working with schools to build in times during the day where kids can meditate together. And, I th th and I, because my particular interest is in TM, uh, to, to, to uh, create periods where they can do, because most teenagers don't want to do stuff that other kids aren't doing. And, and so I'm, I'm looking to, and so if they do it in school though, other kids are doing it, they'll doing it. And, and we're, we're all for practice of mindfulness. Um, Ned, do you want to comment too? Yeah, yeah, no, I was just gonna say, a, a lot of kids, a lot of people learn mindfulness. Mindfulness in some ways is a little bit easier to do, and maybe, and for some people, a little, a, a little bit easier to do, but harder to practice. TM, because you have to go to a center and there's kind of a prescribed way of learning it, takes a little bit more to learn, but once you do it, it's a little bit easier to practice. Um, in part because you're not you're not trying to fight against your own thoughts. It just it just goes with it. But but the the chapter explains both of these, and, and we think the real benefits to both of these. But but the idea of a mantra is something that, that you learn as part of the the, the, the process the training process for TM. Hi, I'm a parent. Uh, you mentioned a couple times in your talk the the need to have uh, flow for a child and to develop a passion. What if that 
<laughs> only passion that yeah. child has, that 12-year-old boy, is video games. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get these children's brains to be healthy throughout, to be, and you know, to, to proceed throughout life with a happy, healthy brain. What is your feeling when the kid really just wants to suck on the video games and there is no soccer or tennis or poetry? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of things to say on this, and we get this, we get this quite a bit. Um, one thing, the, the American Associ Academy of Pediatricians talks about technology generally and trying to make it a shared experience. If your kid is in her room watching videos all day long by herself, that, that because we think about technology, there's one, there's the issue of wiring of the brain, but two, what's, what's given up, right? So if, we, if, we, if it crowds out sleep, if it crowds out physical activity, if it crowds out, you know, FaceTime with, with people, that's really a problem. My son right now is in the middle of this kind of ridiculous video game, but he does it when he plays it with his friends, right? And so they coordinate and they're on their phones and, and, and it's a shared experience. And so I, I think we want to be careful that all video games are not the same. And, and so one thing I would start with is it's a, pretty, it's a pretty nice idea to explore what that is, right? You know, my daughter's on her phone and it, rather than saying, get off this, well, what are you playing? And sit down, can you show me how that works, right? She was playing Wii U, you know, and she said, Said, can I can I play with you? It's like, Daddy, you're terrible. No, you only make me lose, right? So I just sat there and sort of cheered her on, and it can be a shared experience. I would say if it, if if it becomes the point that it's crowding out too many other things, like their problems with sleep, if you can't turn it off, you know, if there are fights about it all the time, th then you start to have a problem. But, I, but we think that you kind of want to negotiate with him, you know, of, we, I'd like to, you know, what can we agree that you take care of first, and then after that you can do, can do this work. Like I have a kid who's a, he's a senior in high school now, he's very ADHD, and he realized, if I play video games first, I'll never get my work done. And he comes home from school, does his homework, gets it done, and he's doing beautifully in school, and after that he can play games as much as he wants, so long as he goes to bed and it might be five hours but he does his homework plays video games and he goes to bed and he's well rested it wouldn't be my ideal right but it's not screwing up his sleep and it's not screwing up what he, his ability to, to pay attention to other things in our book we talk quite a little quite a bit about the process of collaborative problem solving uh, which uh, is, is long has a long history in, in parenting uh, made uh, particularly popular in psychology by a guy named Ross Green. And, and the process starts with you express empathy. It's a discussion you have with your kid. And it starts with empathy. So you, you, you express empathy for how, how, much, how much you love these games. And, and, and with, with kids like this, I, I say, you're probably going to be a techie when you grow up. And, and I want you to do this stuff. And, I, and there's a lot of evidence that, that certain kinds of games are, are good, have, have, have benefits for the brain. At the same time, as your mother, I know that the more time you spend in fr front of the screen, is associated with mental health problems, with physical problems, with attention problems, behavior problems, and I can't in good conscience let you play on this stuff six hours a day. And so I think part of it is, is, is you negotiate. And, and if kids can't get off it, you, you say, look, look I, I can't live with this, let, let, let's, we, we come to agreement, and if a kid violates the agreement, you, you, he, he doesn't use it for a day, gets another tr try, that kind of thing. But it's this contracting, because the kids, if you try to take it away from you, put it away, it has, it has a good short-term benefit in many ways. But it, it, uh, kids need to wrestle with this themselves. And certainly, we don't want kids to go off to college who haven't had the experience of, of having to, to struggle with this themselves and figure out how to regulate their own use of technology. And I'll give a real quick shout out to people who know PEP, the Parent Encouragement Program. They have a lot of really great workshops in, uh, about how to be collaborative and how to handle technology in, in, your, in your home yeah. um, because yeah. it's, it's certainly something that, that's more common than not. And there's a decent chapter in our book on it, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming, folks. <laughs>